recording now and everyone is coming in from the waiting room and now we are going live on Facebook. Nice to see all these faces. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hi, Tom. <laughs> Just so everyone knows, this will also be live on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash Hirschberg Foundation. If you, for some reason, lose connection or get kicked off, um, you can always see it there. And this record, this presentation is going to be recorded, so you can come back to it at any time in case you miss anything. Um, feel free to add questions or comments in the chat. Um, and, uh, please mute yourselves just so that we can hear everyone. Um, I have to do one more thing and then we should be ready to get going. You can talk or... <laughs> Nice to see all the faces with the names here. Welcome, Hi, everybody. Tom. Hi, Tom. <laughs> Welcome. Tom's going to stay muted, I think, right? But can, you, can we see your hat? Yeah, very nice. <laughs> very time. nice. Oh, gosh. All, how wonderful to see. Wendy Commons joining us today. Hi, Wendy. Oh, look at Sarah Banks showed up too. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Nice to see everyone. Martin, Evelyn, Gilda. We got Esther Birdie. Nice. All right. Wonderful. Thank you all for your patience. Um, again, we're also live on Facebook. So if your internet is a little unstable or if you somehow get disconnected, you can watch via Facebook. Um, I moderate the comments there as well. And in one moment, I will pass this whole thing over to the wonderful Amy Reese, who is our patient and family care coordinator extraordinaire. Yes. <laughs> you probably know her. <laughs> I'm guessing. She manages all of our patient and family relations. She's fantastic and she is the best resource that you could ever ask for. So without further ado, Amy. Alyssa, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, hello and welcome to the Hirschberg Foundation for Pancreatic Cancer Research Webinar, Celebrate and Learn from 10, 20, and 30-Year Pancreatic Cancer Survivors. My name is Amy Reese and I'm the Patient and Family Support Coordinator for the Foundation. First, I'd like to acknowledge and thank all of our wonderful sponsors who helped make these webinars possible. Please ask your questions either during or after the discussion by clicking on the chat button at the bottom of the screen and type and submit your question. We will open the discussion for all after our conversation with Donna, Michelle, and Philip, and we'll do our best to answer all your questions. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website, pancreatic.org. It's my pleasure to welcome back to our patient and family webinar series, Dr. Elizabeth Cleary, who is a licensed clinical psychologist for the Sims Mann UCLA Center for Integrative Oncology. In this role, she provides counseling to individuals, couples, and families delivering direct patient care in UCLA oncology clinics and supervises and teaches advanced graduate students in clinical psychology and social work. Dr. Cleary also plays an important role in patient care as part of the Hirschberg Center for Pancreatic Diseases, 
IPU, our integrated practice unit. We're grateful to have her as well as Donna, Michelle and Philip with us today to celebrate and learn. And before we begin, Aggie would love to say a few words. I've been waiting for my turn. Okay, good evening, everybody. I can't see all the faces, but the ones I do see is, are, is just wonderful. Um, I wanna, want to welcome you to this very meaningful event for me. Um, it is my birthday today. Thank you, Phil, for, for, for <laughs> saying something earlier. So it's my birthday and I wish to celebrate by the greatest gift I could possibly get is uh, to hear from you guys. Uh, thank you, Donna, Michelle, Phil, for sharing your journeys with all of us. Um, you are all of our heroes. I also want the three of you to know that you have guests from, from three continents, Australia, England, and the United States. <laughs> Let's go. Here's, here is Elizabeth. Happy birthday, Aggie. Thank you so much, Amy and Aggie, for your warm welcomes and heartfelt start to this. Um, I, I'm so looking forward to this conversation and, and learning from our panelists. Um, I also want to start by thanking Aggie. It's, it's really incredible to think about Aggie as an individual, her team having a direct and tangible effect on survivorship uh, for individuals with pancreatic cancer through their leadership, fundraising, supportive research, trials, direct patient care, more people will be living longer following pancreatic cancer. More people will be reaching these incredible milestones of survivorship. And I think that is really something worth celebrating. So thank you. Thank you, Aggie. Thank you, Aggie's team. Um, in terms of our goals for this evening, we have so much hard earned wisdom amongst our three survivors here. Um, I'm so grateful that they are gonna be so generous with their time. They have been on the receiving end of being wow. told about a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. They have sat in chairs receiving chemotherapy. They have undergone intensive surgery, the process mm -hmm. of recovery. They've waited for scans and feedback from their physicians. They've navigated our complicated medical system. They've learned what it means to advocate for themselves. They've managed both the good and bad of people trying to support them, ask questions, show up for them. And this is our opportunity to really learn from them tonight. Um, another goal for tonight is really to generate hope. It's inherently hopeful to get to hear from folks who have walked through really difficult things and are here to tell us how they did it. We're going to be honest tonight. I think all of us here know the reality of cancer, the parts that are full of suffering and grief and loss. Um, we're not going to sugarcoat things, but we also have so much to learn and we're going to be focused on solutions, ways to cope, how to be active. We're going to share information. Um, and through all that, I think we're really going to, to generate some hope here tonight. I have the honor of introducing our three panelists. It's really impossible to summarize anyone in a few sentences, even a paragraph, even a whole book. Um, and we know that these individuals are so much more than their diagnoses or their medical histories. But I, I know it's also important for our listeners to have a sense of where each of our panelists are speaking from, what treatment they've received, what their experience has been like. So I'm gonna share a few details about each panelist. And then throughout the course of our discussion, I know we're going to get to hear a lot more from each of them about their experiences. First, we have Donna Collin, who received a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer in 2010. Regarding her treatment history, she's received chemotherapy, she's undergone surgery, she's participated in a clinical trial that utilized immunotherapy. Donna remains in treatment and has recently retired from a long, uh, successful career in fundraising. Um, Donna, we are so glad to have you here tonight and, and your sweet pup, Lucy, um, sitting on Donna's lap there. We got, we got an earlier introduction. 
Our next panelist, Michelle Hackbarth, received a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer in 2001, one month after her 51st birthday. Michelle received extensive chemotherapy, radiation, and eventually surgery. Having heard Michelle speak at Hirschberg events previously, I know she has a great sense of humor. I'm eager to hear from her the things that have helped her retain that sense of humor throughout treatment and beyond. Thank you so much, Michelle, for being here. And lastly, Philip Phil Rangel received his diagnosis over 30 years ago. Uh, Phil underwent a 19 hour surgery back in 1991. And Phil will share with us the importance of family support, his faith, and the purpose he derives from his work as a certified behavioral health education, um, health education specialist at a men's homeless shelter. So again, so, so much wisdom. I, I, know, I know we want to hear from all three of these participants just what, what it has taken to get them where they are today. Um, and again, thank you all so much for your time tonight. Um, first, I am interested to hear from each of our participants, each of our panelists, about their current quality of life. How is your energy? How is your strength? How is your ability to do what you want to do on a daily basis? So, if we can start, um, if we can start with Michelle, how 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 are you doing and feeling these days? Well, I'm feeling great, and um, I think that I probably am healthier than I might have been before I got sick over 20 years ago because I eat better and, um, and exercise more. Um, I can do anything and everything I want, except that I wanna go skiing. I can't ski by myself because I can't get up when I fall. But I think that has something to do with my age and not the diagnosis. That's it, I feel great. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And Donna, how, how about you? How, how are you feeling these days? How's your energy, strength? Oh, Donna, we can't hear you. Okay, is that better? Yes. Okay, um, I think of the three of us, I'm the only one who's currently in treatment. So um, I, I can speak during the periods of time when I was not in treatment, I felt great. I felt terrific. I had some, you know, chronic issues abdominal issues after I had a, um, a distal pancreatectomy and a splenectomy, those are the surgeries I had. And I've had over the years some digestive issues, but you know, it didn't really hold me back. Um, but now I'm in, I'm in treatment right now, I'm in a clinical trial at UCLA. And you know, there are days when I don't feel as great as other days, to be quite frank. Um, on the days when I, you know, have recovered more, I mean, I, I do crazy things I move furniture in my house. I do, you know, all sorts of, I walk my dogs. I do, you know, kind of normal stuff. I clean my house. I, you know, just kind of a normal COVID sort of life. Thank you, Donna. And, and Phil, how about you? How, how have you been feeling? Well, I'm, since after the surgery pull stop, I've always been active physically, you know, involved in athletics in high school and in college. So I think for me, in, in regards to that, I'm, I'm very active physically. I, I exercise six days a week um, and um, I feel good again, like the other panelists just described. I, I do live a normal life, um, you know, travel been out throughout Europe and Australia and different parts of South America. Um, with family, uh, with my wife. Um, I guess my disposition has always been uh, to be able to um, be proactive in your recovery uh, from pancreatic cancer and um, be resourceful. And I think those are the things that, um, those are the, my pillars in my life uh, that motivate me to get up in the morning and exercise and then 85% of the time I eat healthy, 15% um, uh, I fall off the wagon, you know, I just, I, just I, I, I do my best, but 
I don't want to become so dogmatic where I begin to dread living a healthy, active life. So it's a little bit of, of everything for me. Absolutely. Uh, no, I think so. that flexibility, that flexibility is, is key. It's important. It's important to have that perspective. And even when you go down or when you, the dark path appears, it's your choice to continue walking down that path or uh, just yield to the right path and just continue down whatever's been working for you. Don't delineate from that and then try to, thankfully with a lot of what's uh, the new, uh, the technology that we have for nutrition and health and living active, I, you know, I, I take advantage of those resources and try to incorporate them into my life within the realm of reason, you know, like age pay, plays a factor. I'm in my mid sixties, I'll be 65, 66 in April. And so sometimes it's, I have to attribute it to that where I do feel tired sometimes. I am, I received the diagnosis of being a diabetic after uh, mm -hmm. the surgery. Um, and so I deal with that. Uh, and, and, and Phil, can I ask you, so we received um, several questions around nutrition. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you feel like diet has played a role in your health, either prior to diagnosis or in survivorship. And we also specifically had a question um, from our audience about whether any of our panelists have followed any particular diet. Keto was mentioned, for example, mm -hmm. um, but just wondering about the role of nutrition, any specific diet that you may, may follow. I, I think basically uh, for me, it's, uh, you know, the food chart that you had in grade school where they tell you a little bit of this, a little bit of that. I don't do too much dairy products, mostly greens, uh, whatever I choose. I like broccoli, I like um, Brussels sprouts, uh, spinach, uh, carrots, beets. I juice, I juice, I have a, an omega juicer, so I, 80% uh, uh, of the time I juice beet, carrot, turmeric, it's an anti-inflammatory, uh, and some apple. Um, and then, you know, try to stay hydrated a lot. Um, because of being active. Um, so I think for me, a little bit of meat, a little bit of chicken, a little bit of fish, and then sometimes it's just uh, Mediterranean is what's appealing to me. I really enjoy Mediterranean mm -hmm. food. Uh, I think it's a really great diet. Um, you know, I have roots from the diet that they eat in Israel. Um, so I tend to lean that way, not not rigorously, but I, I just enjoy it. My favorite foods are the Asian foods, the Thai foods, Korean food, um, concentrating more on the carbohydrates and vegetables versus the meat. I don't eat pork. Yeah. Um, it's just Thank a choice. Um, Thank you. No, I, I hear kind of all the, the nutrient dense and really mm -hmm. focusing on mm -hmm. Right, leafy greens, vegetables. Mm -hmm. um, Donna, Donna, what about you? What What do you see as the role of nutrition, diet, in terms of recovery, survivorship? I just, I sort of eat this. Try to eat a healthy diet. I don't. I'm not strict about it. I mean, I feel lucky that I happen to love vegetables. I'm. I. It's not a it's not a sacrifice or some kind of punishment for me to have a lot of vegetables in my diet because I just like it anyway. Um, I admit to having a sweet tooth and I probably indulge it more than I should because you know, uh, uh, you know I'm probably on the verge of diabetes if not over the line. So I try to be mindful of it, but I don't always do such a great job with it. To be frank, um, I. I want to enjoy my life as well. I mean, I don't want to be rigid about it. Um, and uh, I don't know. I, you know, I live by myself, so I don't, I don't cook big meals. I generally eat very simply at night, you know, either like a big salad with some kind of protein on it, um, chicken or fish generally. And that's it. I mean, I don't do anything uh, super fancy when it comes to my diet. Sounds good. Thank you, Donna. And Michelle, anything that you would add or say differently about the role of nutrition and diet for you? Um, I eat um, almost everything. 
and anything, but um, I did cut out coffee and I, I, and I don't drink coffee anymore because I drank a lot of coffee before I was diagnosed and they thought there might be a connection. I don't think there is, but um, I do take enzymes with certain meals that are fattier. And um, I, I was thinking about today and what we're gonna be saying. And I know that when I was undergoing treatment, like many of the people are, I discovered that um, ways that I thought were healthy to eat were not necessarily the right way to eat when I was on chemo. So where I would try to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, I discovered that it was better to eat canned fruits and canned vegetables. They were easier on my stomach. And everyone who's going through this right now, I think the best thing you could do is work, uh, meet with a nutritionist because you eat differently when you're on chemo treatment than you do afterwards. That's, that's a great point that, that, right. That the type of treatment you're receiving can really affect, um, what, what diet might be best for you at a particular point in time. Mm -hmm. Um, one of our audience members asked whether any of you used alternative treatments in conjunction with the medical treatments that you received or put differently, whether you felt like you did anything special that contributed to being a long-term survivor. Michelle, maybe we can start again with you. Any alternative treatments that you used in conjunction? Um, I didn't do alternative treatments I would have if I thought that was the only way to go, but I did use traditional treatments, medicine, chemotherapy, and so on. But I also did things like um, visual memory, uh, visualization I did just on my own, um, prayer, letting, I let everyone know what I was going through and people were praying for me and thinking me about me and sending me positive thoughts from all over the world. I'm still on some people's prayer list, which is a little embarrassing because it's 20 years later and I'm not under, under treatment, but they still pray for me every day, which is wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. And, and Phil, what about you? Any alternative treatments, um, things that you feel like may have contributed to you being a long-term survivor? Nope, I just described it all in a nutshell, I kind of lived that way the last 30 years. Um, I started off in what they call the dark ages of pancreatic cancer. There wasn't really much available other than the, what they were using uh, for treatment and things like that. So I had to advocate for myself uh, that way in a humble way, not in a pompous way. When I say for myself, I mean, I, I really had to do research and find out for myself. Fortunately for me and my wife, when we were in college, you know, eating organic was, was just starting in the 70s. And so we had, I had a tendency to always kind of be attracted to that way of life, that lifestyle. And, and she mentioned earlier, uh, the Donna, about coffee. Um, oh, no, I wasn't done. It was Michelle. Um, I've dr been drinking coffee um, the last 30 years. I love black coffee in the morning. Uh, and so that's probably, I don't drink soda and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, it's what I just described. I, I, I don't see, uh, I do have some issues with digestion, but I take um, organic psyllium husk powder um, every night in the evening. And that, that's huge for me because I did have, after the surgery and recovery, I had digestive issues big time. Uh, and just to ask you a follow-up question, we're, we're, we are going to talk a bit about what it means to advocate for oneself in the context of pancreatic cancer, but since you mentioned it, I, I wanted to ask when, when you said that you, you had to advocate for yourself, mm -hmm. um, what, what did that look like? What did, what did advocacy? Well, you, it's like, you know, your college student kicked in, do your research. Uh, and that's what I was drawn to. Uh, and thankfully, Jay Cordish, the juice man, popped on the scene, I think in the early 90s, maybe mid 90s. And so he was on commercials and that's kind of how I got into juicing because he was also diagnosed with cancer, not pancreatic cancer, but he was a survivor of cancer. So I didn't, I just said cancer is cancer. So if it's working for him and I saw how he looked and he was vibrant and full of energy and, and things like that. So I said, that's what I meant by advocating. I had to go out and find out for myself 
what did I lose in terms of the, the surgery and the diagnosis, you know, in terms of minerals and all those things. So I did, I do take supplements. I take zinc, nitrate, and I take, um, uh, uh, what's the other one? Vitamin D and magnesium um, religiously uh, every day without fail. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just, uh, I do take insulin, very low dose once in the morning. So yeah, I am. Um, I, I, you, you have to, I mean, the worst is over. That was my attitude and the best is yet to come, but it was me acknowledging, well, what is the best is yet to come for me? What does it mean for me? Mm -hmm. So I put everything down in writing. I, I wanted to travel. I wanted to be with my kids. I wanted to see them grow up. These were for me, things that were tangible, that were real to me and valuable and important to me. Yeah. And, it, and it wasn't drawing in, but it was the opposite. It was like expanding my periphery so that I could see more than just uh, overcoming the surgery, which was supposed to be six hours and it was 19 hours. So mm -hmm. it, that, that in itself, that experience really was an, a rude awakening for me. Yeah. So that's why I said, if the worst is over, then the best is yet to come. And it was me having to take that initiative and began to advocate and, and, you know, of course, with the support of family and children and things like that. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. And, and Donna, what about you and any um, alternative or complementary treat treatments that you tried? I really, I have not. And it's not because I don't believe in them. I do. I mean, I would, I would say to anybody do, you know, I'm very open to it in a way, but I just, haven't done it myself. I can't tell you why, but um, just haven't. I've kind of I've done all the different modalities. I've had surgery and radiation and chemo and you know back and forth and so forth, but I haven't done um, anything else. Okay, thank you. And Donna, speaking of treatment, so one of the questions we have is is what what would you tell someone who's newly diagnosed, um, someone who's about to embark on treatment, what, what advice or guidance might you have for them? Or what, put a different way, what, what do you wish you had known um, for starting treatment? Uh, I knew nothing when I started this journey. I knew nothing and I, I was in the best shape of my life when I was diagnosed. Um, but I couldn't understand, you know, to me, it was like, oh my God, how could, how can my body betray me like this? You know, I've taken, I take such, you know, good care of my body. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I exercise like crazy. I eat right. I, I'm such a girl scout. I'm just like the most boring person in the world. You know, how could this happen? Um, but it, it did, um, what do I wish I had known? I wish I had been more um, at certain points, not, not in the beginning so much, but toward further along in the journey. I wish I had um, kind of questioned my doctors more or sought a second opinion more easily than I did. I eventually did, but it took me a long time to get there. Um, I wish I had been more um, knowledgeable about clinical trials. Um, so those are the, that's a big, a big one right there. Those are really, really great suggestions. Thank you, Donna. Yeah. Michelle, what, what about you? What, what do you wish you had known at the start of treatment? What would you say if you were talking to someone who just received a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer? Well, if they just received a diagnosis, I would tell them um, to have hope. As you said at the very beginning, how important it is. And when you're first diagnosed, it's so devastating. And if you go online, you just see just horrible things about it. And mm -hmm. so I would just say, have hope. And there's many, many, many people who beat this and that they should try to be one of those people, hopefully. And then I, the main thing that I, I did not know about was the diet, even though people told, told me about that. And I already mentioned about being careful what you eat when you're on chemo. And, um, you know, just it's hard during these times, especially because it's so hard to get outside anyway, but 
if you just can continue to go for walks. Um, I know sometimes you have problems um, being away from a bathroom, so wear a depend. I can remember after one of my surgeries, the only distance I could walk was about 50 feet. And then the next day it was twice that, and the next day was three times that. So to keep moving and, um, you know, just, and, and also to reach out to other people. Like the Hirschberg Foundation is such a wonderful uh, support to offer so much support to many people and connections. It's really important to talk to other people and, and get, you know, think so that they, they can give you hope. That's, that's it, I think. Thank you, Michelle. Phil, anything that you would add in terms of speaking with someone who's newly diagnosed, things you wish you had known? Um, I wish Hirschberg would have been around in 1990, seriously. Uh, you know, it was, it was really nothing out there. Honestly, any type of organization that, uh, that I could think of, but I think um, Michelle used a key word for me, which is hope. And for me, it was, well, what is hope? And for me, hope, my definition of hope is having a confident expectation of something good. So I never let go of that. And that's pretty much how I live now, I hope. And if I have hope, then I have to activate my hope and have confidence that I'm expecting something good in spite of. Uh, so, you know, for me, it's, you know, it's like, well, you know, you're not living in reality, but well, that's my reality. And I have the evidence to prove it. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this for the last 30 years. And so my hope today is to reach 90. And so I'm going to continue down this path and I'm not going to relent from it because it's like I say, the only way you can qualify or verify your hope is with evidence, with proof. Give me the proof you doctors should know that better than anybody. What proof do you have? And so sometimes people are skeptical when they hear that I have many years of survivorship and they look at me, they go, well, they don't, you don't look like it. I said, well, how am I supposed to look? If you don't believe me, I can show you the 37 inch scar in my stomach. Mm. And I can show you the CT scan where it shows um, less than uh, the 30, 40% of a pancreas, no spleen, no gallbladder, and two or three feet of intestine missing. If you want that proof, I have, I can provide you the proof. Yeah. There isn't much during that time uh, for people that were, you know, all we knew was that people were having the surgery and then dying a year, 18 months later, and that was it. And that's what my doctor told me. Mm -hmm. He said, the surgeon, you'll have 18 months to three years to live, and that's it. Yeah. And Phil, I, I wanna ask you, you mentioned family earlier. I, I know in our audience today that we have a number of family members, um, partners, daughters, sons, uh, friends. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious for you, what was, what was the most helpful kind of support that you received from family or friends? What, what made a difference in terms of what people said or how people supported you? It was tough. But um, I have to say, uh, we are a small family. Um, my, my siblings and my mom was, was still alive at the time. They were just very negative. And so I respectfully requested them to minimize their visitations and you know, everything was, you know, I could hear them, you know, is he gonna die today? And, and so I, I never wanted to feel like this may be the last time I'm going to see you type of thing. So I had to make a, a really a, a tough decision. And so I ended up, you know, retreating from that environment. And so my wife and my kids, when I had the surgery, we have four. Um, they, were, they were very small, two, five, uh, eight, and 11. So, and they were, they were great. All they knew was we have daddy back and, you know, it was them, me watching them grow, and I believe them watching me, hey, dad's still here. You know, they never really came uh, with uh, like uh, anything negative, it was just their kiss and their smile. How was your school? So I disconnected myself from myself and, and plugged myself into what they were doing. 
and this became active in their active life. And I, and I hear how you were intentional, right, about kind of who, who you surrounded yourself Absolutely. with Absolutely. and, Not and my, I mean, boundaries. I love my mom and sisters and everybody. I don't want to hear negativity. I don't, I don't want to be around doom and gloom and darkness. I don't. Mm -hmm. So I, I, it, was, it, it was, in a way, it was hurtful, but you know, they had to respect my, my position. And, you, know, and you have to be around positive minded, positive thinking, people that are inspirational, look for inspiration somewhere outside yourself, outside your environment. Mm -hmm. uh, like tonight, you know, um, I'm inspired by uh, Donna and Michelle. Thank you, Phil. Because they have 30 years combined, so we're even right now. <laughs> <laughs> and Donna, what, what about you? What would you say was the most helpful kind of support or things that people said um, yeah, in terms of supporting you. Um, I don't know. I would answer it in a little bit different way. I can't think of, you know, people can say all kinds of ridiculous things as, as we find out, you know, like shockingly ridiculous things, actually. But mm -hmm. um, the way I choose to think about it is that, you know, for me, I think of the people that were really supportive. Um, for me, my brother, uh, I have two kids, but I was very protective of my kids. Um, uh, my brother was has become my hero the whole time because he was the one that helped me um, when I was having trouble with my doctor, uh, but afraid to leave. He said he said something that was like a smack in the face to me, but it was so helpful. He said to me, Donna, you're acting like an abused woman. And I thought, what? That's a, you know, it was just, I was shocked. I was dumbfounded. But I thought, after I thought of that, I thought, oh my God, he's right. I don't have to be afraid to leave a doctor that I'm not working well with. Um, sometimes the truth, you know, you need to hear the hard, cold truth. Um, I'll never forget it. And he's the one that has helped me all along. And when I've come to a juncture where I need to make a decision about what doctor am I going to go to, what kind of treatment, how do I um, work through that decision? He's very calm, very logical. Uh, I defer a lot of the research to him because I can't, it bothers me, frankly. So um, I've learned to, it's okay to ask people for help. It's still hard. It's still very hard. You know, I feel embarrassed. I'm a very independent person. You know, when you have to ask somebody to do something for you or accept an offer or whatever, it's just, sometimes I, I still cringe about it, but I learn that people um, genuinely want to be uh, helpful to you in a part of your life. So that was a big lesson to me. Absolutely. No, right. The importance of delegating certain tasks, the importance Absolutely. of accepting Absolutely. help. And I think when it comes to communication with medical providers, as you said, um, the, the importance of asking questions, you, you can always be polite, but you can be assertive about what feels like it's working or not working. Um, and as you mentioned previously too, always the opportunity to get a second opinion, consult with other experts and, and to try and make sure that you feel very confident in the treatment that you're receiving and whatever next steps um, are, are coming. So a lot of good wisdom there. Thank you, Donna. Um, Michelle, what about you in, in terms of support, things that you found particularly helpful? Um, well, I found, my, I'm very lucky that I have a very supportive family and a lot of friends and they were all very helpful and just being there for me when I wanted them and, and needed them and taking me to appointments and someone set up meals to be delivered, which was more helpful for my family than for myself because I really didn't feel like eating. But the, I think the thing that they did that was the best is they allowed me to live as normally as I had before and not not dwell on it. I think Donna or someone, I'm not sure if it was Donna or Philip, well, Philip mentioned negativity and Donna also mentioned 
about some people being negative and they just if i wanted to just act like i didn't have it they treated me the same way which was great and i remember i uh, developed blood clots and uh which required that i had to give myself shots it was supposed to be twice a day but i didn't want to have to give myself shots twice a day because i planned on going out to dinner and I didn't want to have to shoot up in a bathroom, a public bathroom, <laughs> I convinced my doctor to give me a larger dosage once a day <laughs> so I could inject in the morning in the privacy of my old home. So um, th that's how they were helpful, just to just being there for me, being the friends they always were. And um, I feel very fortunate. Thank you. Another question asked about the how you manage the worry or anxiety that comes up before scans, before follow-up medical appointments um, in this phase of survivorship. Uh, maybe Michelle, starting with you, how do you experience and manage any anticipatory worry about follow-ups? Well, I, I may be a little unique in that it I, I don't get anxious about going and having scans and I'm I don't mind going to the doctors even in this time, um, but I, I, um, you know, always look at the reports and sometimes see them even before the doctors do, and I always question everything that I'm not sure about, and um, I just look at it as if something pops up again. I mean, I am getting older, so something probably will that I'm just going to hit it head on like I did before, and we'll deal with it. The sooner, the better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Phil, what about you? Uh, any, any strategies for managing any worry about scans, follow-up medical appointments? Uh, for, well, for me, it's um, exercise helps a lot. Um, prayer, I, yeah, I pray. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, again, it's, it's that four letter word, hope. I'm always hoping for the best. I don't, I, again, I don't want to sound redundant, but I don't relent from that, from that word at all. Mm -hmm. For me, is is a catalyst uh, that can illuminate your pathway that way. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just exercise and, and try to read material literature that's inspiring. That doesn't necessarily have to be a, a cancer survivor story. It, it could be, you know, somebody 90 years old uh, swimming across a, a canal or something like that. I said, well, thank I can do it, then uh, I'm on, you know, let, let's go. I'm just, I'm just opening up more about embracing all the great things that life has in store. And so for me, it's more of, a, uh, of an adventure uh, to see what's in store. I can't see it with my eye, but my hope tells me that you have a point of reference and I do have a point of reference of everything, the evidence. I'm real big, I'm a real black and white type of guy. So I need proof at the end of, or otherwise I'll go on to something else. And so for me, I, I haven't let go of, of my hope uh, for a long and healthy and active life to 90. After that, you know, I'm done. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty much it for me. Thank you. Try to keep it simple. Yes. Donna, what about you? Strategies to manage uncertainty, worry? I'm a big proponent of hiding my head in the sand. <laughs> um, honestly, I'm, I'm a work in progress on this. There are some times where I notice over the years that I've become more relaxed about when there have been long stretches where things are going fine, there's been no drama or anything. I find myself being more relaxed about, about getting, you know, having a scan and waiting to hear the results. Like um, other times I'm not, I just had a, I just had a scan last week and talked to my doctor yesterday about it. Um, I'm just, it, it varies a little bit all the time. I think for me, trying to just go about my day and trying to act as though everything is normal in my life. You know, I do the things I always do. You know, I try to, I just try to maintain a normal routine and pretend that my life is totally normal, nothing to get excited about. 
and sometimes it works and honestly sometimes it doesn't i think i you know would be a, doing a disservice to everybody to say oh i never get nervous i just never get nervous i'm always cool as a cucumber no i don't believe that at all i think that we're all going to have times where you know you're more nervous than other times and i don't have any magic bullet to tell you seriously i know i know what works best for me mm -hmm. No, I, I think that's a great, honest answer. And as a psychologist, we we often advocate for the just the important importance of naming and labeling those feelings. That the goal isn't you know trying to make them disappear, but that there's a lot of power in just being able to acknowledge and say, "I am worried about this. I do feel anxious about this." Um, so I, I I absolutely hear you that that's. You know, those are legitimate feelings um, and ones that make a lot of sense to have. Um, my colleague, Wendy Conlon is here. Um, I don't know if you're willing to answer a genetic specific question for, for us, Wendy. I know I'm putting you on the spot here. Um, one of the audience members had asked, is there a genetic component to pancreatic cancer? I'm wondering if you could give us a high level answer to that question. Sure. Um, so I've been a proponent of genetic testing for patients with pancreatic adenocarcinoma before NCCN came out with their guidelines late last year, but um, now uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network agrees that everybody with pancreatic adenocarcinoma should have genetic testing to see if they do carry a gene that explains their diagnosis because it's important for your care. Um, if you have an inherited mutation in, in certain genes, there are targeted chemotherapies available to you. Um, and then we can also plan better for your future. Um, you know, we've got three long-term survivors here. And if a person carries a mutation in a cancer predisposition gene, we want to dial in what we need to keep on top of you for going forward to keep you living your best life. Um, and then this information is really important for your family members because we can step up screening and surveillance for other relatives who carry that same mutation to keep them living a long and healthy life. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, a couple questions were focused specifically on managing indigestion, other issues, GI issues following treatment. Do any of our panelists have um, anything they'd like to share in, in terms of strategies, approaches that have helped manage some of the, the GI issues that often accompany treatment for pancreatic cancer? <laughs> I don't have anything smart to say about it, honestly. I feel like I've been, it's this has been a 10 year process for me. On any given day, my stomach feels weird. Um, I've looked for, um, I've talked to various doctors about it. I've been tested, I've been, you know, you name it, and nobody can seem to figure it out. They just kind of, Sometimes they just kind of look at me funny, you know? Um, and I understand, I just, I'm not, it's not a matter that I don't want to accept the way that I feel, but I feel like if there is something that they can help it along, I'd like to know about it. Um, but on the other hand, if there isn't, then, oh, well, there just isn't. And I have to learn how to live with it. Um, you cannot accept, you know, Doctors are not immune to saying stupid things either. I think that's important for everybody to know. And my internist at one point when I, I don't see her anymore, she retired, but I, I remember this clear as a bell because I just stared at her. One time she told me that I was getting old, I shouldn't exercise so much. You know, that I remember pretty clearly when I kind of hurt my foot doing something. I, I said, okay, just, I don't know what to do with that one, but. Then at a certain point when I, you know, and during a routine visit, and she said, well, how are you? How are you? And I said, my stomach, you know, I continue to have problems. And she goes, you know, I think you should just go see a psychiatrist. <laughs> and I thought, okay, 
time for a new doctor. I mean, I'm, I'm very clear about what bothers me and what the boundaries are around what I think is my own nuttiness and, and what is not. And I, you know, I guess my point is that doctors don't always have the exact right answer to these things it's, it's it's a mystery to me it really is absolutely i don't have anything smart to say about how to make, fix it or make it feel better no I, I i think you just had a lot of smart things to say about it so thank you phil or michelle anything that you would add michelle go ahead ladies first Um, I don't really have, it was, it was a question I forgot, was it on diet? <laughs> Man management of indigestion, other GI issues. Uh, well, I just, I did mention earlier about taking Creon and I don't know if everyone's who's uh, is taking, are taking enzymes. I didn't start taking them for, until a couple years after I was diagnosed and treated. And then I took them forever, just the same amount every day, each meal. And then I was having side effects that I thought might've been result of the Creon. So I cut back and now I'm taking them again, just with meals that probably need it or just lunch and dinner. So, um, but I, fortunately for me, as I mentioned, I can eat almost anything. So, Phil, Philip? Yes, um, again, for me, it was, um, I did have issues with digestion and things like that. So again, this research, um, foods that are easily digestible, um, that your body can break down a lot easier. And so those are the things that I described. Most, a lot of greens, um, you know, try to stay away from white rice, uh, that kind of stuff. You know, complex carbohydrates are a little bit more uh, hard to digest. And so I did, I tried, you know, the vitamins, the, uh, the papaya pills and things like that. And, I, I think I finally found what works for me. And that, again, I mentioned it previously, and that's you know, organic psyllium husks because there are no side effects to it. And so I take two tablespoons at night with 12 ounces of water and I have no problems with digestion. Indigestion sometimes, and it's because I have a tendency to lean, especially when I go have Thai food, I've always liked spicy, but you do pay the price for it later. So I uh, try to stay educated that way and remind myself to just kind of do things in moderation. Uh, but again, it's just looking for and doing research for things that are more easily, foods that are, red meat is not easily digestible, pork's not easily digestible, chicken and fish. And um, you know, again, like I said, the Mediterranean diet for me is probably what, um, is more attractive to me than all the others. Um, and then, so yeah, it's just trying to keep it simple and um, diversify your, your nutritional needs and, and habits. Um, uh, I, again, I think Donna mentioned earlier, I, I do have a sweet tooth yeah, and I have two gold crowns to prove it. So <laughs> I, love, I love chocolate, I love chocolate cake and vanilla ice cream and all that good stuff. So I do treat myself and that's my fall off the wagon time. And sometimes it's hard uh, to get back on the wagon because it tastes so good. And so for me, that's a reward for me for all the hard work. And I'll just get back on track uh, and get back on for six days and, and exercise and then just turn into a glutton either Saturday or Sunday and just pig out. <laughs> I mean, that's part of life, you know, it's enjoy the the sweeter things of life, I guess. And, and yeah, so that, that's what works for me, but I did try, a, you know, organic papaya, uh, pineapple has a lot of digestive enzymes, mango works for me too. Uh, again, it, it's high in vitamin C and digestive enzymes, uh, but you know, it's seasonal and sometimes the fruit's not as good as it should be. And so I went with organic psyllium husks. Um, and it's been working for me for the last five years. Five years I've been on that. And, and I can see that Alyssa has been um, putting some information in the chat to, to spell out some of the specific things that are mentioned um, so that people can follow up on that. Um, getting, getting to some of our final questions here. Uh, 
you know, in, in the medical literature, um, when it comes to cancer and survivorship, often things are written in the language of statistics. I'm curious to hear how Aggie, Aggie's giving you thumbs down, um, how, how you think about statistics, how they apply to you, how they apply to, to other patients. Um, well, welcome, welcome your thoughts on statistics. Maybe Michelle, we can start with you. Well, I agree with Aggie, thumbs down. And I don't think that you should ever ask a doctor or a doctor should ever tell you how much time that they think you have left because nobody knows. And I, it, it's very difficult to continue to be hopeful when you're given such a horrible diagnosis. So I, I just say they're getting better. I mean, when you do look, they are increasing. I remember once I went to a doctor and I, a gastroenterologist and said something about, and there was less than 1% chance I'd be here in five years. And he said, and he goes, what do you think you're really special? It's now gotten up to 5%. And so I said, well, yeah, I thought it was special, but I, I just don't look at them. And if you do make it a goal that you're gonna, you're, you're gonna beat them and go up to the top of the chart up high. So that's it. Thank you, Michelle. Phil, what about you? Statistics? Statistics for me are a very important indicator, but I don't rely on statistics. Uh, and I believe that I've disproven statistics uh, for myself. I can't speak for anybody else, but I think that they're important as a point of reference, uh, something to kind of gauge your, and like, again, like I said, when after the surgery, right before I was released from the hospital after five months, um, I asked the doctors and they came out with the statistics say, you got 18 months to three years. So, so that was my point of reference and that's kind of where everything that I've shared during this time, um, I developed and I embraced and I applied. And so the old, the old saying, the proof's in the pudding, you're looking at them. Phil, I hate to, I hate to bug, bother you right in here, but is it true that you outlived the doctor that said that to you? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say no comment. <laughs> I'll be graceful that way because uh, no, actually, no. The the one one of the gastroenterologists, which is my main guy, Doctor Doctor Weingarten. Um, I I think when we had the last conversation that he retired, so I couldn't get a hold of him. But my surgeon, Doctor Rossi, is still around. He's 74 and he's been at it for 49 years. His specialty is the pancreas. Uh, and so I put a call into him and left him a message. Uh, so, yeah, he, he looked at me and I asked him, you know, my thing was, you know, I had a high regard for doctors and I still do. Uh, and I asked him that question. I said, what do I do now with, you know, in terms of nutrition and recovery and things like that? And he looked at me squarely, guys, you're asking the wrong guy. I eat bacon, I eat whatever. So I couldn't give you any kind of advice for nutrition, so. <laughs> that's why when I started, I said, well, I guess I'm gonna have to do this on my own because if the two doctors that are, that have been treating me um, don't have an answer, they're like, don't look at me, I eat whatever. <laughs> so it was, and which was good. You know, I, I took it as a, an inspiration to go out and, and advocate for myself that way um, for, um, for that. And so I think, you know, over the years, people have, you know, said, you know, how old are you? And, you know, how did you, and so you don't look your age and things like that. And I say that, you know, with humility, I don't, I'm not bragging on myself. I just, my encounters that I've had with people and, um, you know, and they're like, you don't look like somebody that's, well, what am I supposed to look like? You know, uh, what, what, what does a cancer, a pancreatic cancer, I, I call myself an overcomer, not a survivor. Um, because it's over with for me. Um, I think it, uh, you know, that's what I'm saying. I, it's this old saying that I, I heard in the movie one time. I'm sure you guys may be familiar with it, the Shawshank Redemption. And uh, Morgan Freeman says, get busy living or get busy dying. It's up to you. And so I choose to live that way. And I'm gonna continue, like I said, 90 years, that's, that's my goal after that. I'm ready to go home.
Thank you, Phil. Mm -hmm. Donna, what about you and, and feelings about statistics? Have you heard the expression, there's lies, damn lies, and then statistics? <laughs> okay. I, 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 and I, speak, uh, I speak only for myself because for some people, knowledge is power. Mm. And in a lot of different contexts, I would agree with that, but not in this one. I don't want to know it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to think about it because I know what I'm like and I'll sit, I'll take that information in and then I'll ruminate upon it and think about it and get upset about it. And I, it doesn't serve me to know the, the, those statistics. It just simply does not. I don't want to hear it. So that's, that's the way it works for me. You know, other people may find comfort or feel like a sense of control from knowing it. I just can say what's good for me and I know that it's not, I don't want to hear it or know it. It doesn't do me any, doesn't serve me in any way. So Thanks. leave that to other people. Thank you. Well, I, I have one final question on the theme of hope. But before I get to that, I want to check in with Alyssa, Amy. I, I've been trying to follow the questions in the chat, but are there any, any final questions from you, from our audience members, before we move in the direction of, of hope? Thank you, Dr. Cleary. Donna, you had a question for Michelle and Philip. Yeah, I do. Um, during your 20 and 30 years, respectively, have you had um, relapses or times where you had to go back in treatment or have you had clear sailing for the entire time? Um, I'll go first, Philip, since you're so polite. Um, I have had, I haven't, fortunately, I haven't had any pancreas setbacks with a pan pancreas, but I used to, well, I have had what I probably have thought was pancreatitis a couple times a year, and I've dealt with that. Um, and so I just, you know, I haven't, I've had scans and so on, but other than that, I've been very lucky. Yeah, for me, I, I think I had, I spoke to Aggie back in November and I did have some, it was pretty scary for me because the same symptoms I had in 1990 appeared last year. And so I waited about a week or so um, and they didn't go away. So it, I, I saw it as a wake up call and uh, I said, well, maybe if, if it comes back, it comes back, I'll we'll have to deal with it. Thankfully, there's more knowledge and more research and more treatment today than there was back in 1990. So I did, I went to, to see my doctor and I went to a gastroenterologist and he did uh, colonoscopy and in the endoscopy and thankfully it was uh, it was a gastrointestinal issue with digestion and things like that but the symptoms were identical to what I was experiencing so you know I was told back then that the pancreas is plays possum it plays dumb and sometimes trying to to find uh, to, to diagnose it is is very challenging it was back then uh, you know, because you can have abdominal pain uh, in the center, in the side. And for me, that's how it, all, how it all started. I was having a lot of what they call a runner stitch sensation on my left side of the abdomen. And so I, that's what I ran it. You know, I just blew it off as that. Um, and so those kind of symptoms came back. Uh, then I was having abdominal pain and then I wasn't able to digest um, was constipated, and so I. In a way, I'll be honest. I was kind of freaking out. I didn't share anything with my wife or my kids. I just, I wasn't trying to do it all alone because I know my body a lot better today, and I'm really in tune to that. And so I don't spend every living day looking for symptoms uh, to go to the doctor. But at the same time, I, I try to use the wisdom that I've attained through life's experiences and say, well, you know, she's available and he's available, so. And I have health insurance, so it's go go get it checked out. And thankfully, I got a clean bill of health, so um, I'm good. And I've had some scans in the past that I have record of. And, and yeah, so no, I'm I'm still proactive that way. And if, you know, and I'm really in tune to my body. 
uh, because of the goal that I set for myself. It's 90 years. Thank you, Phil. Mm -hmm. Amy or Alyssa, any, any other questions? Well, I think anything we didn't cover, um, I think because of the time, we should probably start to wrap this up. And anyone feel free to reach out to me at amy at pancreatic.org. Um, and I'll do my best to get answers from, um, from these three today. I just wanted to quickly say thank you, Dr. Cleary, for your great questions and moderating today. Um, thank you, Philip, Michelle, and Donna for your candor, guidance, and generosity. Uh, it's so important that we continue to gather and communicate during COVID. Uh, so thank you, Aggie, for creating this special webinar on your special day. Yeah. Absolutely. You done? I think uh, just one. one no, one. I'm in a hurry. I, I can see that online. <laughs> Each other have this community, all of us at large, for yourself, for your family. Just one, one hope that you're holding close uh, tonight. I wish you continued good health. And I hope that we've offered everyone involved today um, courage and hope. And I hope that what Wendy mentioned that they we come up or you got somebody comes up with the researchers with a way to diagnose pancreatic cancer early and that I hope that they will start making it just common that you have um, genetic testing and that they test all of your family members and that's covered by your insurance. Excellent, excellent hopes. Oh, my hope. Yes, please. Well, whoever's out there. I hope that uh, you'll open up your checkbook. We need money for more research and more support. So I that's my hope is that, uh, you know, people that are reluctant uh, uh, to open up the checkbook or the pocketbook and invest in, I believe is a, a very, very solid and uh, very integrous um, organization. Um, I adopted myself into the Hirschberg Foundation back in 2011 because, like I said, it wasn't around in the 90s. And so I'm a firm believer in everything that they're doing and the doctors that they grant seed grants to and things like that. I think they're, they're um, almost on the cutting edge of, you know, a breakthrough. That's my sense based on the literature that I've read. Um, breakthroughs is not the same as a cure. So I don't want it to be misinterpreted that way. But I believe that we, we do, you need money uh, to be able to continue the work and the support and uh, you know resources uh, for, I don't wanna sound, I, I don't like to say for the coming people that could be diagnosed with it, but you know, it's, they need, we need more of, of a Hirschberg to grow. It needs to grow and it needs money to grow so that they can reach more people. Okay, so my suggestion is that Phil joins our staff immediately. <laughs> I'll pick up on that. <laughs> well, uh, I'd, be more, I'd be honored, so yeah. Let, 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 me, let me close with the fact that this foundation started 24 years ago and I knew that in 18 months we would have all the answers to ca cancer because in business you can get a result in, mm -hmm. in 18 months and it's 23 years later. And I think year 20 is when I really started to see acceleration. And now it's daily. Um, Amy and I read, uh, you know, uh, uh, day, daily updates from, um, from across the country, from across the world. And it's, uh, it's, it's, that's what's amazing me now so i'm i'm still here i'm not going i'm not going until we're done so thank you very 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 much each and every one of you michelle donna for giving us your your hearts um and i hope i hope everybody look uh, learned a little so thank you so much